thank you for joining me for another Sunday Afternoons with Reverend Lucretia. I'm so glad you're here. And so we made it. We've been talking about Lent all for the last 40 days. And here we are. We have finally made it to Palm Sunday. And woohoo, we're only one week away from Easter. So yes, it's time for celebration. So the name of today's talk is Hold On for the Miracle. And the song is Courage by Kevin Weinbarger. So we are wrapping up Lent. We're looking at the historical and spiritual context of Holy Week as we get closer and closer and closer to the triumph of Easter, which is only a couple of days away. We will be talking about the unity perspective. We will obviously be talking about lots of scripture. We'll be talking about the Holy Week each single day that we go through of Holy Week. Uh, we'll be talking about the resurrection. We're going to be talking a little bit about the juxtaposition between traditional and the new thought perspective on Easter. So all of Holy Week is about the message of hope. It's hope through the lesson of forgiveness, through God's spirit that lives within us and the powers that that gives us, to the fact that God never stops loving us and we are celebrating that, to how to be released from sin. So it was a long week for Jesus and for his apostles. The last four days in particular were filled with fear, anxiety, loneliness and betrayal. Jesus knew what was ahead of him uh, and the hard moments that were coming. He was human, so he had the human feelings that we all experience. Uh, in the end, he obviously committed himself to God's will, um, and that is the greatest manifestation of power that he had. Uh, so the week reminds us to hold on for the miracle that despite our feelings of despair, fear, why is this happening to me? I didn't ask for this, God. Through all of it, the miracle does come. So one third of Mark's gospel, one third is dedicated to Holy Week. So this week is set up part. It is called consecrated. It is different from every other week of the year. We will be talking about every single day and what happens. So in the beginning, back in Jesus's time, when he was going through this time um, of the crucifixion, there were about 120 followers. Now, there are estimated to be 2.3 billion Christians, B with a B, B, billion. So one out of every three people on the planet says that they are Christian. And so we want to look at why did this change happen? Why did it spread so far and so fast? It is the single most important event in history. It split history into AD and BC. Every single event that has taken place after that has been calculated based on the date of Jesus's birth. So one of the reasons why it was so big is because it spread the message of hope for everyone. So as you know, Jesus died for our sins. We get past our error thinking. The greatest sin of all is feeling that we are separate from God, which never could be true. Jesus taught that God is love. And as we experience that love and we live in a way committed to showing that love, we are fulfilling God's greatest commandment. He taught us about the lesson of forgiveness, that forgiveness is for now and for always. As you know, when God forgives us our sins, they are totally erased. They never happened. They are gone. We are free from any kind of guilt. We get past our sins, which again, in aside from the actual physical acts of sins, are the error thinking that we have so that we can move on. We have hope because we now have God's spirit within us. So as you know, when Jesus left, uh, he said, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to send down my Holy Spirit to you. So he said, don't do anything until you get the Holy Spirit. Don't do it on your own power. Do it on my power. Acts 1, 8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and will tell people everywhere about me. Jesus said he would give us the power to do things that we couldn't do on our own. We would go from fearful to fearless, from hopeless to hopeful, from being cowards to being courageous. God never intended for us to go through life on our own power. He wants to have a personal relationship with us so that we can feel his love and his power and the spirit of him living inside us. Until you are plugged into that power, you can't possibly live up to your potential. So Ephesians 1.19 says, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe in him. It is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. 
the power to be free from your past, the power to break the memories that are holding you back, to start over, to change things you thought you could never change, to overcome habits and hurts and hang-ups that hold you back. Hope we will have because God will never stop loving us. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and we know that everlasting means forever. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, No eye has ever seen, no ear has ever heard, and no mind has ever imagined the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. So let's jump right into scripture talking about hope. Psalm 25, 5, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are God, my savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Psalm 33, 22, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as you put our hope in you. Romans 5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 12, 12, be joyful in hope patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. And 13, 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Colossians 1, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So let's talk a little bit about the new thought beliefs about the experience that we have when we go through Easter. So as you know, Palm Sunday commemorates Jesus' Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where the multitudes cried out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. The thoughts of our mind, the cells of our body, the events of our lives are like the multitudes that waited for Jesus appearance of the Spirit of God in our midst so that we could feel Christ in our consciousness. These are the words of Fillmore. We are filled with a sense of praise and song. Christ enters into our lives and transformation takes place. So Jerusalem is symbolic of the holy city. It symbolizes within us the possession and vision of peace an awareness of prosperity within us, the abiding consciousness of spiritual rest, a continuous realization of the spiritual powers, the spiritual poise and confidence. The hosannas and the spreading of the garments and the leaves represent joyful obedience and homage to the thoughts in one's consciousness when the error state of mind is overcome. The spirit of him that raised up Jesus dwells in me and I am made perfect. Even as Jesus come to bless and heal, those who seek to express more of the faith, light, love, joy, enthusiasm, enthusiasm and dedication of the Christ spirit also come in the name of the Lord. Pray for the ability to see as Jesus saw, to have patience like his, courage like his, to take action when action is needed, to meet challenges with poise, and to receive from them the blessings that they give us. Pray to understand and appreciate the good in all experiences. The people in the crowd on Palm Sunday made a choice to honor Jesus' divinity and to recognize him as the Christ. I choose to look for the sacred in each person, to find the light of God is in there. Jesus symbolizes the I am identity. His going up to Jerusalem means our taking the last step in the unfoldment, preparing for the final step where our personality and our ego is entirely crucified and the Christ spirit triumphs. Jesus riding in on the donkey is the fulfillment of the time when the spiritual I am within us takes control and lifts the physical sense-oriented man to the plane of mastery, purity, and peace. When the I am takes charge of the body, a new order comes into being and the whole consciousness is raised to a higher standard. Butterworth says, most people have a hard time understanding that Jesus' desire was to help people to know their identity, to show himself as a great example of what every person could do and be. Remember all these things that I too, you too can do if you have faith. That's direct from scripture. Understand the divine presence within yourself. The goal is to discover the dynamic power of your Christ self. Jesus was on the last leg of his journey, the lifetime of personal overcoming. His life was devoted to proving the principle of the divinity of man. Jesus was committed to teaching the spiritual principle that the kingdom of God is within every single person. No matter what the trial, there is triumph within it. No matter what the cross, there is resurrection. 
Jesus said, you have heard it said of old, but I say unto you, now is the time. That's John 4, 23. The great important essence of Jesus' teaching is putting it all in the present tense. This moment, the kingdom of God is within us. It is at hand now. Now you become a child of God. Now you can realize the truth. Celebrate this now experience in remembrance of your own release from the human consciousness, and you will have the freedom to evolve into the divine creature that you are. Get it all into the present tense. Be here now. So I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Week. We are in the Holy Week. The Holy Week actually started the day before Palm Sunday, which is called Lazarus Saturday on Saturday. It took place in Bethany, which the metaphysical meaning of that is the wailing and lamentation and the overcoming of those conditions. Jesus was told two days before when he was on his way to Lazarus, two days before he was told that he had died, Lazarus had died. By the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. He was laid in the tomb. John eleven fourteen says, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad I was not there for your sakes, so that you can believe, because Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, and only if he had been dead for four days would people believe that the power of God was in Jesus. Martha was upset that Jesus didn't get there, but she said, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give to you. Jesus tells how Lazarus will rise up. Jesus said, this is where he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he shall live. And whoever is alive and believes in me shall never die. Jesus went to the tomb in tears. In John eleven thirty nine, 39, it says, Jesus said, take away this stone. Did not I say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus prayed. Father, I thank thee. Thou hast heard me, and I know that thou always hears me. I say these words so that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Lazarus, come out. So some thoughts about what this could mean. So it could mean that the bringing out is the burial in our subconscious, the removal of any blocks that we have neglected, some quality or activity that we have not allowed to be manifested in our lives. So when we move the stone away from the tomb, those blocks are able to be released. Jesus's prayer comes out, is restoring the idea which is asleep in our subconscious, any old talent, any relationship that needs to be healed, any health commitment, all of that come out means the restoring of the truth. Jesus saw Mary weeping and he wept also. That is our spiritual self is integrated with our human self with love and compassion. These are the thoughts of the unity of Rehoboth Beach. So Sandy Sauter is the uh, reverend that talks about this. So Palm Sunday, let's talk where we are Palm Sunday. So the walk from Bethany to Bethphage means a place in consciousness where grace is realized, where it sends the apostles to find a colt and a donkey that represents meekness, stubbornness, persistency, and endurance. You ride the donkey to make them obedient. It represents control over the will, taking dominion over our thoughts and ruling our physical self. Laying the palms on the ground signifies an unlimited resource of strength. This is the supreme I am. Jesus is stating the law of the spirit in the development of life action. And it represents overcoming everyday troubles and entering Jerusalem, a place of peace, by controlling our thoughts. So at the same time that he was walking in on the donkey riding in, on the other end, on the west side of the city, Pontius Pilate was entering armored with troops and with a fancy horse, and he came showing a power of force. Jesus was showing that great spiritual power does not need physical expression. Our own spiritual power is not of this world. It is a quiet grace, a loving presence. Okay, so the next day is Holy Monday. Jesus goes back to Jerusalem, and this is the time where he turns over the tables in the temple. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on. He drove out all who were there who were buying and selling. He turned over the tables, and he says, It is written in my house. It should be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of thieves. Once the temple was cleared of the money changers and the butchers, um, the lame came in and the blind came in, and he was, they were cured by Jesus. 
Holy Tuesday is the next day. Um, it, it's called by some in the Catholic Church. It's called Testing Tuesday. He was asked by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests questions. Questions like whose authority gave you the ability to turn over those tables yesterday? They had stewed over it all night. Um, by, they had questions about paying taxes and they had questions about what is the great commandment. That is where that question is asked. And remember that there were three questions asked of him. This is reminiscent of the three questions that were asked of Jesus when he was in the desert that was asked to him by the devil. And then again, right before he gets crucified, he again is asked three questions. So the three is very significant. So the next day is Wednesday. It's called Spy Wednesday. This is the day of Judas' betrayal. Judas represents the unredeemed life forces. He resorts to underhanded methods to reach financial obligations. He was betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 represents the dedication to a particular task. It is the age when you can take on responsibilities. So both John the Baptist and Jesus began their ministries at age 30. So the next day is Maundy Thursday. That's the day of the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane experience. Pontius Pilate is often thought of as the enemy. He symbolizes our external circumstances that seem overwhelming. Pilate thinks he has a power over Jesus and asks questions, and Jesus' response is, the power does not lie with you, Pilate, but with God. It didn't matter what Pontius Pilate did, he was demonstrating that no situation or circumstance or external authority had any power over him. And then, of course, the next day is Good Friday, the day of great joy because of the circumstance that comes on Easter, but the horrible, horrible day of the crucifixion. So I just want to remark on the two thieves that were on both sides of him. The two thieves on either side represent the past and the future, the two sides of us as well, the physical and the spiritual side, the human power versus the spiritual power. Jesus represents the here and now. He's in the middle. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He's all about bringing everything into the present moment. Paradise is in our minds and our hearts. The cross represents to cross out error thoughts. Always experience two sides of life, but now is what counts, and now is the time when we can cross out our thinking that is out of alignment with the truth. So the Lamsa Bible says that the last words in the original Aramaic language can be translated as, it is for this purpose that I was born. The moment Jesus had been preparing for all of his life. This was the case for Jesus and it is the case for us. Whatever we are going through, we need not to be overwhelmed. We need to remember who we are spiritually. We are made in the image and the likeness and of God. It is an opportunity to go beyond self-imposed boundaries, to become our highest and best self, and to shine as we never had before. I can't wait for Easter. We're going to have this magnificent celebration on Easter. So Easter Saturday is the day before Easter Sunday. It is the dark night of the soul, a time for introspection, to move from the formed to the unformed to the reformed into the transformation experience. Charles Fillmore wrote, the three days Jesus was in the tomb represent the three steps in over coming error. The first is non-resistance. The second is the taking on of divine activity and receiving the will of God. And the third is the assimilation and fulfillment of the divine will. I overcome resistance and step forward to claim the Christ in me. So here's what I know. I've spent the whole week praying and studying and contemplating and asking God for answers on how to explain the meaning of this week. And what I understand is that there's no way to understand it. There's no way to explain it in rational terms. It is an emotional and a spiritual and a heartfelt experience. I spent lots of time in guided meditation with Father Toops, who goes through this description of the events as if he was right there with Jesus. Extreme attention is paid to every single detail, and he was really good at it. I'll leave a link so that if you want to go back and watch those videos, you can. In every meditation, he describes so intricately the details of the moment that I got it, what it would have been like to be able to be in the presence of Jesus. Father Tooth talks about St. Ignatius Loyola's style of what he calls imaginative prayer, where we enter into the Bible passage and experience it. At one point, he talks about how God knows all about us, how we don't even need to hide, we don't ever need to be afraid, we don't ever need to hold anything back because Jesus knows exactly, God knows exactly who we are. I've always known this, I could talk to God about anything. 
But this time he talked about looking into the eyes of Jesus. And I have to tell you, it was overwhelming. I felt like I was right there. The amount of detail that was paid to what it must have been like to be there in the presence of Jesus was overwhelming. And allowing Jesus to look at you, knowing everything that he knows about you. As I imagine sitting in the presence of God in the form of Jesus and just allowing him to look at me, knowing everything about me, I went through several different stages. There was a point where it was very uncomfortable for me. There was a point where I was squirming. And then finally, I was able to relax and let go. I did this and several other imaginative prayer sessions throughout the week. I came to a better understanding of Jesus the person and that as a person, he went through many of the same emotions that we do. I imagined his excitement and fear and anxiety and horror as he rode into Jerusalem knowing Phil well. When he rode in, he was making a statement that he was the Messiah, as it had been predicted hundreds of years before, and Jesus knew that there was no turning back now. In Zechariah 9, 9, it talked about how the Messiah was going to ride in on a donkey. He knew that he would be creating turmoil and that the authorities would have to confront him. His rage and his passion at the church on the day when he overturned the table. So just to give you a tiny little um, perspective that I didn't have before that I that I understood better now is that the people would come into town and they would have to change their money into the currency of that town. So there were money changers tables. That's what that was. People would go and change their money. Then once they had the money in the currency of that town, they would go and they would by animals and the animals would be slaughtered by the priest as their way of making a sacrifice. And so the church had turned into a bank with all this money changing and had turned into basically a butcher shop. He said the way they described it, there was, you know, blood all over everywhere. There was screaming of animals that were be slaughtered. And so Jesus went in there and he was like, my God, what have you done? What have you done? And so I understood his horror at how, 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 how much it had been transformed from what it was supposed to be into this new place now. I understand what it was like at the Last Supper, where this was a Passover meal, where he was sitting around with all of his friends, but he knew that they were going to both betray him and abandon him. His loneliness in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he knew this horrific turn of events was coming, and he asked his friends, just pray with me, just sit with me for a while. He needed human comfort. He needed his friends of three years who had been with him to sit with him and just make him feel like he wasn't alone. And they weren't able to do that. They kept on falling asleep. The loneliness and despair and the fear and the pain as he was still a person and he was able to feel all of that. It's really painful to think about the beating and the humiliation and the agony of the crucifixion because to me and to all of you that know he was a person. He was actually a person. He could feel of that. What I came up with at the end of the week went back to looking in his eyes, knowing that more than any other human being, he understands me. He gets me. He has been through every single minute of my life with me, and he loves me in a way that nobody else could. That is the lesson of Holy Week for me, that if I allow God in the form of Jesus and in the Holy Spirit to love me and just sit still and hold on and be willing to receive that overwhelming love, that is what heals me. Love can heal anything that ever goes wrong. And that is why I say, hold on for the miracle, the miracle of transformation in us. When we come to the reality that God lives inside us, outside us, and all around us, that God's love is perfect and everlasting and can pull us through any circumstances we are in that feel scary, overwhelming, or desperate. That on the other side, there is health, happiness, joy, and freedom. And that is the transformation of next week. Hold on for the miracle. Easter is next week. And so it is. Remember at all times, the power is in you. It always has been, and it always will be. I'd love to know your experiences of Holy Week and what insights that you got, what new revelations you were able to feel, the spiritual growth that happened to you as you went through this incredible transformation. And as we get ready for this incredible celebration that is Easter, I send you on your way with many blessings.